Good evening. I'm Leland Vittert. It is a big day for the Biden administration, and there is hope for the embattled president as his Build Back Better bill has gotten new life. Sort of. First, the bad news. Today, just 36% of Americans approve of President Biden, compared to 56% who disapprove. His last big bill, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Plan, passed on November 5th. It was supposed to be a turning point in to turn the graph of his approval numbers up. This graph, however, shows the opposite, a troubling trend for the White House. Since the passage of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the Real Clear Politics average of polls shows he lost two points of approval ratings and gained three points in disapproval ratings. However, the Congressional Budget Office said today his Build Back Better plan will only slightly increase the deficit despite spending $2 trillion in new social, social spending. That's not what Democrats were hoping for. They said it would be fully paid for with tax increases. We'll spare you a trip through the congressional weeds, but House Speaker Nancy Pelosi views this as a green light, and the House could pass the Build Back Better plan in the next 24 hours. That would set up a showdown in the Senate. Either way, there's going to be a showdown in the Senate. Remember John McCain's famous 3 a.m. thumbs down moment? There's the picture of it. That killed the Obamacare repeal, part of President Trump's plan. Well, the same kind of decision now faces Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia. He will face that when the House passes the Build Back Better plan. Manchin is the president's key swing vote in a 50-50 Senate. But right now, as evidenced by his dismal poll numbers, the president doesn't have the political capital to sway anyone, much less a senior senator with an independent streak. Bottom line, President Biden needs a win. But today, he got another political body blow, this time on the border. Already this year, three times as many illegal immigrants have come across as last year. Progress for President Biden would have been a great thing. The one person who could give him a lifeline, the president of Mexico, came to the White House and could have offered to stop the flow of illegal immigrants from Central America through his country. He could have turned around the Remain in Mexico policy and allowed President Biden to put that policy back into effect. He could have taken a harder line on the cartels. Instead, the president of Mexico left Mr. Biden in the deep end of the political pool with no life jacket, treading water. Here is the president of the Border Patrol Council yesterday predicting and explaining today's meeting. All we have to do is look at history. What has Mexico done in the past? And any time that this country has been tough on Mexico, any time that we have tried to force Mexico with such things as tariffs or withholding um, uh, money or economic uh, issues, we've seen Mexico step to the plate. Our reporting indicates none of that happened, either forcing the Mexican's hand or the Mexican stepping up to the plate. And it's an important issue for the president and the White House. Factoring into his 53% disapproval rating is immigration, which ranks fourth on the list of most important issues facing America. We start with News Nation's Kelly Meyer at the White House tonight. Good evening, Kelly. Good evening, Leland. Well, that's right. The elephant in the room really avoided here today. President Biden sitting down face to face with the Mexico president here. Both leaders really avoiding any questions from reporters about immigration. Take a listen. Is Mexico doing enough to stem the flow of migrants, sir? And this as the flood of migrants continues reaching record levels at the southern border. And the U.S. really needs Mexico here to reinstate the Trump era remain in Mexico policy. No word from the president of Mexico on that. Republicans on Capitol Hill are calling for the policy to be reinstated. Here is Republican Senator Rand Paul on the crisis. Yeah, I think we should have a uh, zero tolerance for people coming in illegally. I wouldn't let anybody come in. Uh, people demanding asylum, I think they should stay in Mexico. That's the way we had it under the Trump administration, remain in Mexico policy. It was working. Mr. Biden did say that he talked about the border here today, about broadly about migration in the northern hemisphere, and that he focused on equity. Pretty stunning that for all, for all of the criticism by the Biden candidate uh, campaign over the Trump immigration policies. They want to reinstate a major part of the Trump immigration policy. The person appointed Kelly to oversee the border was the vice president. Where is she today? 
She did meet with uh, the president of Mexico earlier today, two separate meetings uh, between the uh, president and Vice President Harris. Uh, Jen Psaki said today that is not unusual of an administration. But Harris is shifting the blame here to the previous administration, saying that the problem doesn't lie here with their administration. Take a listen. The reality is that we inherited a system, an immigration system that was deeply broken. And this has even some Democrats scratching their heads. One Texas Democrat calling for a new border czar, saying he is moving on from the vice president. This, as we saw that reporting this week of the uh, growing tension and strained relationship between Biden and Harris. And now new reporting today that the vice president's communication director is leaving. Leland. Hmm. Kelly Meyer on a very windy evening in Washington. Kelly, thanks. Appreciate it. Speaking of Vice President Harris, it's been an awful week. First, record low approval numbers for a vice president, not just for her. 27.8% approve, 51.2% disapprove. That is a historic low for any vice president. Next, a hit piece from CNN saying she's been blindsided. Even worse, an ill-timed late-night tweet by the White House press secretary calling attention to the report saying she's been sidelined, and then the hug fest on the White House South Lawn with President Biden. Now, a network TV interview saying there is nothing to see, part three. Take a listen. So you don't feel misused or underused? No, I don't. I am very, very excited about the work that we have accomplished, but I am also absolutely, absolutely clear-eyed that there is a lot more to do and we're gonna get it done. Sometimes if it's true, you don't have to say it. Somebody who knows that well, Lauren Wright, Masters of Polling, Associate Research Scholar at Princeton University. Good to see you, ma'am. We appreciate it. Uh, is Harris's problem now Biden's problem? Yes. Well, vice presidents are very closely attached to the president. And so, yes, if things are not going well for the president, she will get looped in with that. But what's really interesting here is her approval is, in fact, lower than President Biden's. And so while we're not sure what the factors are driving that, it's clear from reporting a lot of Democrats are worried about her electoral viability as the heir apparent to uh, the Democratic nomination for the White House next presidential run. Yeah, and the reporting about just how toxic her office is certainly doesn't help things. The, the, where there's smoke, there's fire in Washington oftentimes. It's kind of interesting because you say it's hard to unpack President Biden's really dismal approval numbers. We saw this on a recent poll. Biden mentally fit. 46% agree, 48% uh, disagree. That's the Politico poll. Uh, that's down from 53, 46 just a month ago. Uh, kind of scary in a way, but also, have you ever even seen this kind of poll been asked? I don't remember ever hearing about President Obama's mental fitness or President Bush's or Bill Clinton's? Well, Trump's. I think Trump's yeah, well, was right. asked sometimes. Um, but no, he's the oldest president that's ever served. And so, yes, this will be something that pollsters ask about. It is very important to differentiate between do voters care the most about something like mental fitness or when it is brought to their attention, how do they evaluate it? So it's still this age old issue that we talk about a lot, Leland, where it's the economy, healthcare, COVID, getting back to normal, uh, my kids, my the schools my kids go to, things that affect your life every day. But yes, when asked, these questions do not go well in general for the president. Right, and when things are going well, people don't tend to focus on bad things. And when things are going badly, then they get more upset. We think about what the White House's talking points were after the Virginia elections that we talked about a lot and after the big Democratic losses nationwide. It was, the problem is, Bipartisan infrastructure hadn't passed. Build Back Better hasn't passed. When they pass, it's going to be great. Well, bipartisan infrastructure did pass. That was supposed to be the turning point. As we pointed out, he's down two points since then. Any reason to think if Build Back Better passes, it's going to be a different result? No, that's just not how public opinion works. Um, Americans don't typically give presidents credit for passing legislation or Congress credit for passing legislation. Um, you know, most elections are a reaction to something that either happened with the last guy that was in office or 
factors that are happening around people in their everyday lives. So there's just really no research to support this idea that things weren't going to bounce back. In addition to that, forces like the economy, inflation, these things presidents really don't have immediate control over. When you make big promises in that arena, and I think it also applies to immigration, which you were talking about earlier in your segment, and things don't change, and Americans observe that things don't improve, um, then you're making promises and not delivering on things you really don't have the tools to impact. Real quickly on immigration, that is something that he can impact. That that has a lot to do with the executive branch. Certainly, uh, you know, he was the one who ordered to stop building the wall, other things. Uh, are we to believe that people really believe that immigration is the most important thing facing America? I had never seen that in a poll or even it being in the top five or 10. It's typically, I would say, in the top 10 issues, but not in the top three issues. And when it's in the news, when there was that crisis with Haitian migrants on the border and people were very upset, um, that, you know, that ticks up uh, higher on the list. But the truth is, presidents have agenda setting power and they have to tell Congress our number one priority is immigration reform. And they have to tell Congress that we're going to put all of our, you know, whatever political we have, whatever political capital we have into this yeah. effort. And Democrats simply have not done that. And I think one of the reasons is there's such a tension between the progressive and moderate yeah. wings of the party they can't even really articulate what their immigration policy is because progressives want more lenient policies yeah, and, we, and well, moderates really just want the issue to stay out of the spotlight. Well, and, yeah, and, and, then, and you also have been, you got Henry Cuellar uh, down in Texas who really wants the border issue dealt with and the border secured. 36% approval rating, you don't have a lot of political capital to whip the progressives right. and moderates into line. Hey, Lauren, it's always good to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Leland. All right. For as bad as the polling is for Democrats, it's equally good for Republicans. Unheard of polling, really, for Republicans. A Quinnipiac poll shows that 46% of Americans want Republicans to win back the House and the Senate, with only 38% wanting Democrats to keep the House. 40% want Democrats to keep the Senate. Stunning poll numbers. It is almost unheard of for Republicans to win what is called the generic ballot. But in a game of hold my beer and watch this, Republicans are fighting to the death over their own internal issues. Former President Trump is stepping up his attacks on the Senate GOP leader Mitch McConnell, writing, quote, McConnell is a fool and he damn well better stop their dream of communism bill and keep his senators in line or he should resign now, something he should have done a long time ago. Never a lot of nuance to President Trump's thoughts. And Mr. Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, is attacking House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy over the 13 Republicans who helped President Biden pass the infrastructure plan. You need to make Democrats take tough votes. You need to make sure that when you've got them on the, the ropes, that you don't throw in the white towel of, of, of surrender. If you're gonna be the Speaker of the House, you gotta be able to control those, those members. If that isn't enough, an hour after the House voted to censure Republican Congressman Paul Gosar over tweeting an animated video appearing to show him killing Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Gosar doubled down, retweeting the animated clip that got him in trouble. Gosar maintains he was not espousing violence. To help us make sense of the seemingly nonsensical, no better man than Tom Bevan, co-founder and president of Real Clear Politics. Uh, Tom, have you ever seen self-inflicted wounds in the way that the Republicans are inflicting them upon themselves? Well, it's certainly, again, as you just set up, Leland, I mean, for as good as the news has been for Republicans on the polling front, it's been a bit of a mess uh, on Capitol Hill. Uh, look, you do have these fighting factions within the Republican Party, obviously. Uh, you know, sort of the, the Trump loyalists versus uh, some of the more moderate uh, establishment type members. You had this thing with Gosar. I mean, there, it, it never ceases to, to fail that, uh, you know, a fringe character on either side of the party, but usually on the Republican side, because that'll get the most media attention, uh, will do something or say something stupid. And it becomes a uh, headline for, you know, a day or two days or three days. In, in the grand scheme of things, this is not really much of anything. Uh, 
Um, but the fact that, you know, Democrats were able to take it and play it up uh, and, and make it as big of a thing as they could make it, uh, turn it into a, a one or two day story and then goes our obviously as you yeah, said, you know, whatever. Just doubled down, down and, on it, made it a three I, or four I guess day he's story. Operating under the uh, under the premise that, you know, any publicity is good publicity. I'm not sure that's true in this case. Yeah, well, sometimes sometimes even when they spell your name right, it's bad publicity. You make a good point about sort of this divide in the Republican Party between the the hardcore MAGA coalition in a way and you'd sort of say mainstream Republicans, but the lines are blurred. How worried are you guys in your from your reporting? How worried are Republican donors and the Republican base that these kinds of distractions and infighting will cost Republicans what they could gain from the polling we're seeing? Well, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I'd say before Virginia and New Jersey, there was a lot of concern in Republican circles about, you know, primaries that are going to happen uh, coming up next year and House candidates, Senate candidates, would Republicans nominate uh, sort of, you know, candidates that could have wide appeal or would they, would they nominate candidates that were more in the sort of hardcore MAGA mold? Um, but when we're seeing the types of numbers that we're seeing, right, uh, you know, almost knocking off Phil Murphy in New Jersey now with these, as you mentioned, the generic ballot numbers are just astonishing. We've never seen in the Washington Post poll it was the biggest number in the history of that poll, 40 years. In battleground states, it's even bigger. So um, I think a lot of Republicans I've talked to have said, look, you know, with numbers this good, it doesn't matter who they nominate, they still would be favored to win in this environment. So that fear has subsided for the time being. Obviously, there's a lot of time between now and next November, though. And, and to the extent that, uh, you know, Democrats are able to make up any sort of ground, I think Republicans will still fret about uh, the, the primaries that are scheduled to happen early next year. Yeah, uh, you can say that again. Tom, uh, great talking to you. We appreciate it as always. And uh, compliments to your reporter, Phil Wegman, who joins us sometimes. His White House stuff is phenomenal. We appreciate all the work you guys do. Thanks, Lou. Yeah, appreciate thank you. It. There's another high-profile murder trial happening right now. It is in addition to the Kyle Rittenhouse case. Why the Ahmed Arbery trial might be the real tinderbox in America. Plus, the Rittenhouse jury is in their third day of deliberations. Is that good or bad for the man you see right there? This is not a political case, and this is not a case about racism, and it never has been. All right, spokesman for Kyle Rittenhouse's family speaking a short time ago to News Nation, Brian Enton, with that interview. This is his nerves run high in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Still no verdict in that murder trial. The jury went home for the day. They'll return to court in the morning after their third day of deliberations in a case that has become a flashpoint in the culture wars. The judge is weighing the defense's second request for mistrial. Rittenhouse, the then 17-year-old, shot and killed two men and wounded another during riots in Kenosha last August. He claims self-defense. There's a lot of evidence to support that claim. The jury had no questions today on evidence. Unlike the past few days, we bring in Bob Bianchi to talk about this, longtime prosecutor. And now, defense attorney Bob, good to see you. Uh, as always, appreciate it. Uh, conventional wisdom, the longer a jury is out, the better it is for the defense. Does that apply here? I don't think so, Leland. This is an extremely complex case. I've tried murder cases that have been, the jury's been out over 20 days. They've got to go over a lot of evidence. They understand the gravity of this situation. They understand that their decision makes a difference. There's a lot of charges. The jury charge was extremely complex and confusing. There's a lot of video footage, which they're dutifully going over. And so, no, I think it's going to take them a while to do their job the right way. So I'm kind of enheartened by it. I don't think it bears one way or the other for where they're moving. We're showing some of the video right now, and, and some of that video is in dispute and at the very heart of these two requests for mistrials, uh, one with prejudice because of what the prosecutor said about Rittenhouse's Fifth Amendment right, and then one about how they turned uh, this video over. What do you make of the judge not ruling on the motions? Well, firstly, uh, Leland, as a former homicide prosecutor, it is extremely disturbing to me to see the way this game, quote unquote, was played by prosecutors. With respect to the motion for a mistrial by commenting on his post-arrest silence on the witness stand, you know that out of law school. You don't need to be a lawyer. This is a seasoned prosecutor. It was an act of desperation because he was watching his self-defense claim, in my opinion, go down in flames. Then there's a second motion with regard to failure to turn over some of this video, uh, video that they had. Not to mention the fact that the prosecutor moved to introduce evidence that the judge had prohibited 
in a pretrial ruling earlier. I believe what the judge is doing here, Leland, is laying low with regard to the motion for a mistrial because he does not want to be the singular person that could potentially throw out a case after the jury's put all this time in for the families of the deceased, the prosecutors, the judges, uh, the defense lawyers, everybody. So what I think he may do is if it's procedurally correct in Wisconsin, it would be in New Jersey, is he takes the verdict. If it's a not guilty verdict, then he doesn't have to rule on the motions. If it is a guilty verdict, then he is going to be compelled to rule on the motions prior to him signing what we call here in Jersey a judgment of conviction, where he actually finalizes and certifies the result of the jury. Somewhere down the line, he has to hear this motion. Whether he does or whether it goes to the appellate division, there have been so many errors in this particular case, self-inflicted by the prosecution or perhaps on purpose, that I cannot imagine having never had a conviction reversed that I've ever tried as a homicide prosecutor, but knowing those decisions that an appellate court is going to say, this trial is not a fair trial, especially commenting to the defendant's right to remain silent. Yeah, st stunning, really. Uh, there's been so many twists and turns, as you pointed out. I, in all my years in television, uh, I haven't ever seen a murder case like this. In all your years as a prosecutor, you hadn't either. It's, uh, it's wild, which is why we have somebody as smart as you to break it down for us. Bob, thank you. Sure, Liam, thanks. Yeah, good to see you. Inez Cantor calls out LeBron James for choosing money over morals. Cantor claims King Jane pretends to care about social justice, but says at the end of the day, they'll really just shut up and dribble. Why he's saying that about James next. Plus, Russian President Vladimir Putin seems to be ready for war. What overtaking Ukraine would mean for Russia and our national security. I want to thank you at home for making News Nation the fastest growing cable network in the country. We'll see you on Twitter and Instagram at Leland Vitter. That's a very significant capability that has the potential to change a lot of things. So we have to be very concerned about that. That's America's number two general explaining China's hypersonic missile technology is far, far more advanced than even we feared. General John Hyten called it a first use weapon that could evade U.S. defense, meaning the Chinese could strike anywhere in the United States with little to no warning. Here's Jen Psaki on both adversaries. I am not ruling out that the president of the United States will speak with the president of Russia at some point in the future. As it relates to how we engage with China, that we see it through the prism of competition. Hmm. As China rises in the Pacific, we now face a greater threat from Russia than any time since the fall of the Berlin Wall 33 years ago this month. They, too, are working on hypersonic missile technology and are launching harsh words on the West. In a speech yesterday, Russian strongman Vladimir Putin said the West is taking Russia's lines too lightly. And you can hear the Paruski music playing in the background. It comes as Putin continues to prepare for an invasion of Ukraine, which would seriously threaten NATO and the U.S.'s position in Europe. In the past, the man on the front lines would have been three-star general, commander of U.S. Army Europe, Ben Hodges. He's now retired and uh, joins us. General, good to see you, sir, as always. You graduated uh, West Point 1980. Uh, are we closer to war than any time since the Cold War? Well, Leland, I think what's concerning is uh, there is so un so much uncertainty, uh, at least during the Cold War. Uh, there were protocols in place. We had uh, a degree of transparency. Um, and it, it felt like even though you had thousands of nuclear weapons on both sides, there was a degree of, of control and, and certainty. Uh, what's different now is you've got a very aggressive uh, Chinese Communist Party and you've got a very aggressive uh, President Putin both of these guys are on the clock. Both of them are thinking about their personal legacy, and both of them are developing weapons that are extremely dangerous. And of course, both of them are looking at the West, where maybe we are not as cohesive and uh, clear in our determination as we may have been in the past. Yeah, I spent time in eastern Ukraine in 2014 when the Russians invaded uh, there, President Obama gave the Ukrainians meals ready to eat and uh, some blankets. Then President Trump came in, gave the Ukrainians anti-tank weapons. The Russians effectively pulled back. Now we can see from those satellite photos that Russia is ready to invade Ukraine once again. Why does it matter to the rest of America sitting at home if Russia invades Ukraine? 
Well, firstly, let me make a correction. Uh, I was a commander of U.S. Army Europe 2014 to 2017, and we provided uh, uh, night vision goggles, uh, communications equipment, counterfire radar, uh, a lot of uh, real capability to Ukrainian armed forces. Oh, fair, 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 fair enough, but non, but non-lethal aid versus the Trump administration's lethal aid, right? Yeah, I think that the provision of javelins uh, to Ukrainian armed forces was an important step. And of course, we just gave them additional javelins, uh, which, which again, providing lethal aid is, is an important symbol that the United States is serious about the region. Uh, Ukraine is not an island, of course. It's on the Black Sea, where we have three NATO allies, Turkey, Romania, and Bulgaria, as well as uh, what we would call partners, Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova. Uh, the Kremlin wants complete control of the Black Sea. The last thing they want is to see U.S. Navy in the Black Sea or the Royal Navy. Uh, and, and for them, Crimea, which they invaded and illegally occupied, um, is the launching pad for all of their malign influence in the Caucasus, in the Balkans, into Syria, and into North Africa. So that's why this is this is contested space. Yeah, I'm how how is the intersection between putin and xi in the sense that it feels like xi tests us and putin then kind of learns from that and then putin tests us and xi learns from it on the other side well what i what i don't know is how much specific coordination there is between the two of them certainly there have been very public uh images and displays of cooperation but I can't tell yet how much coordination there actually is. What I do believe is that both of them look to take advantage of situations that the other may create. For example, um, I think there's a possibility within about five years, we're gonna be in a kinetic conflict with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, obviously, I hope I'm wrong, but I think that's a real yeah, I think possibility. We, yeah, I think we all hope you're wrong, especially with the hypersonic missiles uh, that they're testing now. Hey, General, it was great to get your perspective. And uh, next time, I want to talk a little bit more about that time over in Ukraine, because uh, we all learned a lot about how Putin operated. I know you got some unique uh, perspective there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, thank you. Well, Popular podcast host, former Chicago radio host, Man Cow. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, boy. Finally, a celebrity we can look up to. It's great. Well, I'm, I mean, are your Chinese handlers okay with you talking about this? <laughs> That's the great thing about being independent, my friend. I'm telling you, this is, no, this is a breath of fresh air, Leland, yeah, because exactly. other people are not. This is a huge story, and you can't find it because the Chinese control so much of our media. Yeah. I mean, was... this is really something. Uh, look, this guy is a hero. He's standing up against China. He's standing up against the commissioner. He's standing up against the NBA. This is a Muslim guy. I've been to China. And uh, I can tell you firsthand that they don't have any great love for uh, people that practice that faith. Uh, oh. They really are put through hell in China. Yeah, well, you, so what, yeah. No, and you talk about the, the control the Chinese have. We're, the people that they're uh, oppressing are Muslim Uyghurs, yeah. which is a minority group there. Marriott International just canceled a Uyghur convention where the Uyghurs were going to get together in the United States wow. or another country to try to figure out what they could do to push back against the Chinese. The Marriott, can, Marriott canceled that. Um, no surprise. You know, it's interesting when you break down Inez Cantor's uh, tweet where he talks about, hey, is this research yeah. uh, by LeBron James? Hey, King James. It's got to be, it seems pretty clear at this point that LeBron James, the NBA, just doesn't care about Chinese atrocities. Does Cantor's tweet and how outspoken he is make them have to respond? Let me, this is my Marriott card, so okay. let's get rid of that. I guess I can't use that we didn't, anymore we didn't either. We plan that, so there you go. No, brother, let me, let me, look, let me, let me tell you something. You're really, really so, going to give up all the points you amassed? Well, I may, I may get the points first. Okay, uh, then you're you going to give up the When the cover. cameras aren't on. No, but listen, listen, brother, as you know, Ch China controls all of this, uh, and, and anything, BLM, any, and anything they can do, anything China can do to separate us, to divide and conquer. Yeah. And, and I'm shocked that the NBA is letting this Enos talk. I have Enos envy for this guy, that he's able to go out there and fight this. Yes. Um, we keep trying to get him on. Um, which did you he, see what the shoe, his shoes? Did you yeah, see the shoes? Yeah, he's, his I mean, shoes he's now say genocide. Stock order, and yeah, I mean, this guy's taking stock his order hand. Numbers. Yeah, no, and I'm sure shoes. I don't agree with him on everything, but uh, you know, yeah, anything that divides America, the NBA is all about it. And you know, slavery. LeBron doesn't want to be a slave because he's a slave, according to him. And yet here we have slaves making LeBron's shoes, and he don't want to say anything. It's money is his master, and it is money over morals, which is what Enos 
has been tweeting. Yeah, no, it, it's we want to keep following him. It's pretty amazing. Also amazing what's happening to uh, Peng Shui, the tennis uh, player over in China who's been disappeared uh, after making some sexual assault allegations about a member of the Politburo. I don't think that surprises anybody. You will see how many tennis players are willing to actually take on China. Everyone's saying, oh, my heart's with her, but nobody's taken that stand. Well, it's and the same, John Cena. Do you remember John Cena speaking Chinese, cowering to his, John Cena? Yeah. I mean, how frightening is China? I mean, are, Leland, are we at war right now and we don't even know it? Are we in World War III right now with China? It certainly seems I, like a Cold War. Yeah. You know, the, and, the, and the amount of control they have over our culture because of how much they own in their markets is pretty uh, terrifying. Did you, did you see the tennis player's statement? I didn't mean it. it right. I, I, nothing to see here. Well, no, her, I mean, her statement, her statement that was in emails that were clearly forged. I mean, if you believe Chinese propaganda, you yeah. know they're lying when their lips are moving. Uh, all right, man, Cal, we got to run. Yeah. Great conversation. Right. Thanks, Thank brother. you. There's a reason defendants don't usually take the stand. We're going to show you the disastrous testimony of one of the men who chased down Ahmed Arbery next. You didn't know what this guy was going to do, right? I did not. And all he had done so far is run away from you, right? He has ran past me and uh, ran away, and I, and I let him run away, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But this time, you're not letting him run away. You're pointing a shotgun at him. Never threatened you at all? No, ma'am. Never ever. brandished any weapons? Sir, you're only just trying to finish his answer. Yeah, he did not threaten me verbally, no, ma'am. All right. Didn't brandish any weapons? Uh, no, ma'am. All right, that's one of the three men accused of murdering Ahmed Arbery testifying today, admitting Arbery did not threaten him before he raised his gun. The national focus has been on the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. The Aubrey case has become a real tinderbox on the issue of race. Prosecutors say Travis Michael, along with his father, neighbor, who are all white, chased Aubrey, who is black, through their Georgia neighborhood in their trucks, cornered him, and shot him. The defense say the trio thought Aubrey was behind a series of break ins and claimed the shooting was in self defense. This video that eventually leaked out became a flashpoint in the Black Lives Matter debate. Closing arguments begin next week. We bring in Robert Patilla, civil rights attorney who is there in Georgia, and Jason Hill, professor of philosophy at DePaul University, author of What Do White Americans Owe Black People? It's out in bookstores near you. Racial justice in the age of post-oppression. Gentlemen, good to see you both. Uh, Robert, I'm, I'm interested in your take on the, on the trial. Uh, have you felt as though as up and up and it's been a fair shake so far? Well, you know, it's interesting because we've been down here in Brunswick for the entire week. We went from Savannah to Brunswick to uh, Jacksonville to rally ministers. We met with the Aubrey family. Uh, indeed, Mrs. Aubrey uh, cooked dinner for Reverend Jackson last night while we were here. Uh, but even with the testimony we've seen, the videos, uh, everything that's happened, there's still a, a very much a sense of caution uh, here because of the composition of the jury. As many people are aware, uh, the jury ended up being 11 white people, uh, one African-American, uh, but a among those, uh, the white people, you still had two people who were former law enforcement, one person who was former military, uh, one person who was a former 911 operator. So because of that jury composition, even with Mr. McMichael basically admitting to everything he was charged with on the stand, there's still no confidence here that you will get a guilty verdict. Yeah, Travis McMichael seemed to be the uh, sort of abject lesson for law school and for uh, law students of why you do not put uh, that was video from the Rittenhouse trial, but why you do not put a defendant on the stand. Professor, bring you in on this. Uh, is, as much as the Rittenhouse trial is not about race, is it right that the Arbery trial is about race? I think so. I think, I hope that we're beyond the sort of pale of racism where the average American, white, or but mostly white people can understand that with full forethought of malice, I think McMichael and his father set out to cause damage to a man who posed no threat to them. Now, this, it seemed like they wanted to go hunting and go hunting for trouble. And I think the racial dynamic here is that most Americans, white Americans, will see in good faith that this was a case of racial profiling. Whereas in the case of the Rittenhouse, I think it's more problematic. I don't think with full forethought of malice, this young man set out. He acted foolishly in many cases, in many yeah, ways. Yeah, no, really. Very to, to kill anyone on purpose. Yeah, no, it's right that there's sort of these these two different views of of these cases. We'll get we'll stick at least on Arbery for a minute. This is more of McMichael's testimony. Take a listen. 
She said, we've had a lot of trouble with thieves. It just worries me because my daddy is slap old crazy, LOL. He's old as dirt and doesn't care about jail. And you responded, that's what this world needs more of. My old man is the same way. I did say that, yes, ma'am. And then the next line is, you said, hell, I'm getting that way. I did say that. She said, have to make an example out of somebody. You said, that's right. Hope y'all catch the vermin, correct? I did. Boy, Robert, I can just imagine that when folks are hearing that on the stand, even if there is a conviction, people down in Brunswick have a reason to be pretty angry. Absolutely. I think people also have to remember that this case only is at trial right now because a video leaked out because the neighbor, uh, Roddy Bryant, believed that it was exculpatory for them. There was no video. There would never have been a, an arrest, an indictment, or prosecution. Uh, the first DA in the case is actually currently under indictment and will probably go to jail for her uh, handling of the case and conspiring uh, with the uh, the defendants in this case. The second DA uh, refused to prosecute. The third DA refused to prosecute. It was only once this made national attention and became part of the Black Lives Matter movement, that Attorney General for the state of Georgia, Chris Carr, appointed a special prosecutor, that this case actually came to be prosecuted. So I, I think this is a lesson for America, that we cannot depend on black people to just have a drone following them 24 hours a day uh, to prove that they have been the victims of racial profiling. We have to actually have a system where we listen to, investigate, and believe that there are inequities in the system. Well, certainly there was inequity in the system here. And, and, and you can look at it two ways, right? That there wasn't, that there definitely was inequity, and then it eventually came out, and now, as you point out, the prosecutor is being prosecuted. It's stunning to me, uh, and Professor, I'm sort of looking for the philosophical reasoning for this, because it does seem to draw on the worst parts of America when you've got a defense attorney, a defense attorney uh, saying this in court. Take a listen. There's only so many pastors they can have. And if their pastor's Al Sharpton right now, that's fine, but then that's it. We don't want any more black pastors coming in here. Boy, is that disgusting. It is disgusting, and it shows the desperation of, 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 of the defendant himself. But I think also we're going to be pretty surprised. No, I don't think very few white people are calling McMichael a hero. Yeah, I haven't heard it. I haven't heard it at all. So I don't think he really had to go that far. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point. Maybe we should be heartened by both the fact that the prosecutor is being prosecuted and how uh, abhorrent so many of us all found uh, that comment. Uh, professor, counselor, great to see both of you gentlemen. We appreciate the time and insights as always. Great conversation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. It's been about a month since the tragic shooting on set of Rust and still no one has been charged. Should Alec Baldwin be worried or enjoying his time in Vermont? In the months since Alec Baldwin shot and killed a crew member on his movie set, the original narrative that this was just a tragic accident has all but fallen apart, begging the question, why has nobody been charged? Namely, the trigger man and movie executive producer, Alec Baldwin. Famed attorney Gloria Allred sued the actor yesterday, saying the script never even called for Baldwin to fire the gun. In that scene, there was no script that called for him to discharge a gun. And that is very important. So why the gun was discharged, you know, the facts will have to fully come out. Joining us now, John Spielberg, criminal defense attorney. Gloria Allred is suing civilly, which can be painful financially, but should there be some kind of criminal charges against Alec Baldwin? I think Alec Baldwin is going to be the last one on the criminal charging list if anybody makes it onto the criminal charging list. And I have to disagree with something that Gloria said in that clip. The fact that, that the script did not call for Alec to actually pull the trigger of the gun to me is absolutely meaningless. We're talking about a script. Alec Baldwin was uh, one of the producers. It's not the Constitution. It doesn't take an act of Congress to change a script. You can change a word, change a page, change a scene anytime you want. You're Alec Baldwin. That doesn't make his conduct any more or less egregious. This is still, in my eyes, in many people's eyes, a very tragic accident. 
And when people sue civilly, it's not about putting people behind bars. It's a, all about the Benjamins. And that's what's starting now. Well, Gloria that, just first in line. Yeah, I, I was going to say, it's no surprise that Gloria Allred is first in line when it's all about the Benjamins. <laughs> uh, there, it brings up an important point, though, that you just said about whether or not there was criminal behavior. And part of it goes to this issue of gun safety. I'm not a firearms expert by any stretch of the imagination, but anytime someone hands you a weapon, rule number one, you never point it at something that you are not ready and willing to destroy. You certainly don't exactly. put your trigger on that. This is a armor, somebody who deals with weapons on movie sets, discussing the protocol. Take a listen. There's absolutely no reason why Alec Baldwin should have pointed this weapon at someone, no professional reason in the course of his acting, pointed this weapon at someone and then pulled the trigger. The harsh reality of that is correct. You know, again, you place a weapon in your hand, you take on a uh, duty of safety. So if I place a weapon in my hand, I take upon this duty of safety. I know there is no reason to point it at somebody. And I point it at somebody and I pull the trigger. There's a scenario in which I am not held responsible. So if you were walking down the street and you did that, you would absolutely be responsible. But this is a little different. This is a movie set. And one of the things I think we need to all wrap our minds around is we keep calling this a prop gun. It's not a prop gun. It's a real gun. Right. It was prop ammo, or at least it was supposed to be. So in that sense, it takes a little bit of the responsibility. In other words, you never put your finger on the trigger until you're ready to shoot in real life. But this was not real life in that sense. And that's one of the things that one of the things that will help Alec Baldwin and maybe the others who were responsible hmm. avoid criminal liability here. Yeah, but Civil still, liability yeah, but still, you, still is though, going to you happen. Should, you, you still shouldn't point it at somebody uh, when you pull the trigger. But anyway, we got to leave it there, Jonah. Uh, Jonah, Jonah. I'm... <laughs> oh, it's, 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 <laughs> it's been Thursday, Jonah. It's good to see you. Uh, we'll talk to you Thank soon. You. Dan Abrams, who's never screwed up a name in his life, is next. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact driven, unbiased coverage.